Hey everyone, welcome to the middle of 2020. <laughs> it's, it's been an insane ride, and that's about all I can say about this year, is that it's madness. Um, I haven't done a video in a long time, and I didn't know if I would again. I'm really not that comfortable in front of the video monitor. But uh, in the age of Rona, there have been a lot of people looking for educational information for kids. And in the before times, I used to occasionally teach a class on literature, uh, critical thinking and writing, feminist studies, mythology, you know, um, as you do. And I thought maybe I could do a series of videos in which I talked about some of those aspects. Um, one of them being just the idea that people create in a vacuum. Um, so when we look at literature, when people read stories that happened hundreds of years ago, some cases thousands if you go into Chinese literature and um, things like that, but if you look at these stories, we as people tend to apply them to a context that is relevant to us, that is happening in our time. So you might read something like how it feels to be forcibly fed that took place during the suffrage movement and apply it to your time when really you should probably be putting yourself in the mindset of the person who wrote it then because those are different worlds. Your experiences will help you have connection to the writing, but it may not help you understand the writing. So one of the best examples I use in cases like this is Jane Eyre. When I first read Jane Eyre, I did not like it. I didn't like it. I didn't have a problem with that era of British literature. And so um, I couldn't put my finger on why I didn't like it, other than the trope of Rochester driving himself to insanity and having to be physically handicapped before she would take him back, but I still, there was something about it. it took me years to realize it was the way they portrayed the wife, see. Um, we just read it and we think that maybe she's just honestly crazy, borderline psychotic, um, you know, there's a host of mental illness things you can put on her. And in our time, we do. We think of the psychology behind it. We think of all of those things. And we think of how his wife was deranged. And he was just caring for her poor soul trapped up in the attic. But in the time it was written, you have to remember that women could be put in mental institutions for anything from having a period to talking back to their husbands just didn't want them around anymore. Literally, there was an entire generation movement of women that were locked in mental institutions so that their husbands could get a nice divorce without much fighting about it because, you know, like, she's crazy. I don't need her. <laughs> I don't need her around. She's crazy. We're just going to lock her away, pretend she doesn't exist, go on about our lives. And then what they would do is they would go get a hot young thing and marry her because... Why not? This was this was pretty prevalent among the wealthy. There's a list of things that women could be mentally institutionalized for in the 1800s, and it is just is literally breathing. And so, it it happened happened quite frequently. And it's not a conspiracy theory; it's a historical fact. Several pieces written over it. In fact, President Grover Cleveland, I believe, had his mistress locked in a mental institution, and yeah. Like, when she threatened to come forward about him, just because he wanted to. So, it's a thing that happened quite frequently. So, I'm reading Jane Eyre, and I, I'm like, is his wife really crazy? Is, is she really crazy? Because it's written during a time period when anyone, who was a female especially, could be institutionalized for any reason. And so... She's locked in an attic, essentially institutionalized, devalued, put away, and he starts dating the nanny. But maybe she's not crazy. 
maybe she's just the first wife that he decided he was done with. And, you know, went after the new wife. And if I were locked in an attic while some new woman came in and took care of my kids and I was told that I had to stay away because I was crazy. And remember, we're talking about a time period when it wasn't a psychological diagnosis. It was just, I want to be done with her. She's crazy now. Then is the wife really the bad guy? Who's the bad guy? Who's like, it's him. It's Rochester. He's a horrible, horrible human. And now he doesn't deserve any kind of happiness in the ending. I don't care if he's like, he should have been broke, left on the side of the road, demoralized, run over. And I don't know. But I had a problem with him getting any kind of happy ending, knowing that all of that chaos, all of that madness was likely because he locked his wife in the attic because she was... Not what he wanted. So, and I think she probably wrote it with those kind of intentions on the interpretation. When I look back at it now, I can say, oh, I see what you did there. Um, but because our brains don't read it that way, it was put forward as like romantic literature of these two people who, you know, each had baggage, star-crossed, coming together through thick and thin, they make it out at the end even though one's damaged. But if she's writing it in a time when women are vilified and institutionalized for no reason, then yeah, yeah, she's totally going to make it seem like you put it in the trope of romanticism so people don't fight it. Because if she came right out and been like, look, you people are institutionalizing women for no reason. And it's madness. They'd have locked her up. They'd have, she'd have never been published. It wouldn't have happened. But if she writes it in the trope of the romanticism at the time, it makes it very clear that what she's referring to is the fact that the wife is not as crazy as we think she is. Yeah, she's doing crazy things and she eventually burns down the house, but... Would you? If you were taken from your family and locked in an attic and told, I'm done with you now because maybe you're going through menopause and your hormones are off and you're a little bit crazy, so we're just going to fully declare you insane. I don't even know if that's what her intentions were. Maybe she just thought, well, he's done with his wife. He could lock her in the attic. But, you know, how far would you last as a prisoner in that situation? If they <laughs> took away all of your rights and locked you in an attic and didn't let you take care of your kids and then brought in a young nanny to take care of your kids and pretended you didn't exist. The kids weren't allowed to talk about you. No one knew where you were. How crazy would you be? So if you read it, think of it from that perspective. Think of it in all of the ways in which it could be. All of the things that, that we don't think about with typical romance tropes and realize that the author was very, very smart for her time and likely wrote that in there as a jab at the system of institutionalizing women. It, she just did. Like, I... Because you have to look at it from the time it was written and the moment it was written for. But our brains, they want to put it in our reality because it's so hard to imagine one outside of this. And every single writer writes within their time frame. Like, even if you're writing historical fiction, even if you have researched it to the hilt, your brain is still processing stuff in your current reality the current year. So it can get difficult and it can be hard and thinking about it in that box outside of the box is it's not something we're used to. So I just wanted to record this to say that I'm probably going to try and do series of them talking about different books and ways we could look at them and read them 
and interpret them. And uh, so that if anyone has a high schooler who's maybe missing literature and wants to get in on some ideas of critical thinking and writing and literature and try and help progress themselves at this time when we're all stuck in the house because of a pandemic that I very much worry about becoming endemic, but that's a different matter. Um, then they'll be here. Also, it'll be a way for me to get outside of my Rona head. I mean, because otherwise I might just go a little bit insane. Not that I'm not already, but more so. Um, I plan to cover a few different stories, uh, some mythology tie-ins. I don't do scripts. Um, when I used to teach, I did a lot of discussion back and forth lecture stuff. Uh, so I'm going to try and gather some ideas of what people might want to hear about and then build a video around that. And I'm going to try and do one a week. I make I make no promises that it gets that way because executive dysfunction in the time of the Rona is real. It was big. And uh, it took me three weeks to put together this video and it's literally just me chatting with you people. So I'm probably talking into the void because I don't know how many people are going to watch this, but it is what it is. Three weeks. It's insanity. I hope you all are doing well. I hope that... Everyone stay safe. You don't go out and get sick. And that's about it. Thanks. Bye.